click the link below in the more information box to order your copy of this video in its entirety. Former dispensationalist Philip Morrow explains that this teaching held by dispensationalist is a slur upon the spiritual understanding of the tens of thousands of men mighty in the scriptures whom God gave as teachers to his people during all the Christian centuries before dispensational truth or dispensational error was discovered. Though numerous dispensational apologists have attempted to answer this charge, they cannot explain one major nagging problem. Why did it take over 1800 years to discover something so basic and important as dispensationalism? Why did we have to wait centuries before the church could rightly divide the word in order to understand it? Well, to answer this question, we need to go back to the beginning, to the first part of the 19th century and a man named John Nelson Darby. Known as the father of dispensationalism, J.N. Darby was born in London, England in 1800. He was an honor student at Westminster and later studied law at Trinity College. Upon graduation, he was admitted to the Irish bar, but soon left to pursue more spiritual matters. In 1826, he was ordained a priest in the Church of Ireland and immersed himself in the culture of Anglicanism. Eventually, however, his commendable desire for a deeper knowledge of Christ and biblical truth led him to become disillusioned with the Church of England and its dry religious formality. You had the School of Higher Criticism establishing itself among the various pastors and teachers within the Anglican Church. You have the Tractarian Movement going on, which is a, a, a movement back to Rome. These Plymouth Brethren were reacting to these various things that were becoming influential within a church that already has begun to lose its, lose its zeal. It's become established, very um, formalized, denominational, highly clerical, and as a result, they began to look at the scripture and said, we don't believe that the church reflects the church of the New Testament. There is some degree of plausibility for Darby's rejection the Anglicanism of his day because um, as I studied, I realized that, and I agree with his comments, that the, the religious environment at that time was characterized by a, a corruption in the church. Men, even church leaders, he said, were unsettled in religious matters. Jay and Darby came from a background of education, culture, and aristocratic social standing. He was blessed with a keen mind, a magnetic personality, great management skills, and a tireless zeal for defending and advancing what he believed to be the cause of Christ. One historian, though a critic of his theology and the movement he helped lead, acknowledged Darby's considerable gifts. Darby had many perfectly intelligible titles to success. His attainments were great and varied, apart from his classical and theological scholarship. He could write and speak in several modern languages and translated the whole Bible into French and German. Not long after becoming disenchanted with the Anglican Church, an event occurred that was to redirect the course of his life and service to God. Darby biographer W.G. Turner notes, About this time, between 1827 and 1828, Darby fell from his horse, and while convalescing in Dublin, he came into contact with the little band of original brethren. There was a concept that the early church, the pure church, disintegrated and was lost very quickly by the end of the second century. And it was only until the 19th century that certain people such as Thomas Campbell and Joseph Smith and J.N. Darby and of course uh, the Jehovah's Witness founder um, Charles Taze Russell and others said we are, I am, the one who has been called upon by God to raise up the true church for the latter days. So they called themselves brethren. J.N. Darby came from Ireland. He became a part of their group and he and B.W. Newton worked together. And so dispensationalism 
uh, in the modern sense or in, in the sense that developed in the 19th century can be related directly to this uh, development of an ecclesiological understanding in Plymouth. Inspired by the genuine piety and zeal of the brethren, Darby made his official break with the Church of England. He began fellowshipping with the brethren, meeting in homes for prayer and the study of scriptures, and quickly became one of its leaders and staunchest advocates. As the movement grew, it came to be known as the Plymouth Brethren. Author and former dispensationalist William E. Cox explains, Darby referred to the church as the Brethren. The headquarters for the printing of the Brethren was in Plymouth. Thus it followed naturally for this new denomination to be called Plymouth Brethren, and the name stuck. In 1831, Darby attended a symposium hosted by Lady Theodosa Powers Court, herself a woman of great piety and influence in the Brethren movement. The theme was Bible prophecy. Up until this point, Darby still held to the amillennial position taught by the Church of England. The French Revolution was a cataclysmic event that triggered a tremendous upsurge of prophetic speculation because it was so obviously anti-God, anti-authoritarian, so revolutionary that some people began to wonder if the French Revolution was part of the fulfillment of prophecy of the end days. And what it did, it inspired finally some of the not only responsible people, but some on the fringe element to call together some Bible conferences. These became your first, uh, the Albury conferences, and then the Powers Court conferences. The Powers Court meeting was to revolutionize Darby's view on prophecy, as the new developments that were popping up among the brethren were given free expression. Some of the new expressions that were springing up would include the, the issue concerning the rapture. And it was, it, Bible prophecy was very prevalent at these meetings. And it seems that from that point onward, Darby started to write and to study more. And um, his first publishings came subsequent to the Powers Court um, meetings. His positions on the rapture especially came very soon after. Not only did Darby introduce a new hermeneutic, method of interpretation, and draw a sharp distinction between the church and Israel. For the first time, at least in popular form, Darby taught a pre-tribulation rapture. Dispensationalism teaches a secret rapture which was never taught before in history. And that secret rapture is based on a very distinct program for Israel as compared to the church. Even though Paul the Apostle says that he has made Jew and Gentile one man, uh, the Dispensationalist says no, there will always be uh, the two-body approach uh, to um, eschatology and to prophetic and biblical understanding. So it was really a lot of new issues that came up in the time of the 1830s, thereabouts, which were created by John Nelson Darby and some of his associates uh, that generated this. As noted by Floyd Elmore in the Dictionary of Premillennial Theology, by his own testimony, Darby's dispensational premillennial eschatology was fully formed by 1833. In 1834, Darby wrote a letter to a friend and referred to the newly discovered pre-tribulation rapture theory, stating that the thoughts are new and the teaching new wine. Darby further understood that its newness wasn't simply in context to the Church of England, but to the entire 1800-year history of the church. He encouraged his friend to be discreet and publicly somewhat vague about this new wine, stating, quote, it would not be well to have it so clear, unquote. During the next 15 years, things progressed nicely for the emerging movement. Books and tracts were everywhere, and the new teaching that would become known as dispensationalism was creating no little stir. New members were joining the Brethren and their influence began to be felt outside the confines of the British Isles. In 1845, the first of what would become many schisms tore the Plymouth Brethren almost in half. The problem was in large part centered on Darby's dogmatism and the manner in which these new teachings began to overwhelm the central message of Christ and the cross.
That he was passionate about the things he believed and taught was one thing, but the way he began to treat people who didn't fully accept those beliefs was something entirely different. As Dr. Vern Poitras observed, Darby's contribution may have started with zeal for Christ, but it ended with an indiscriminate rejection of everyone out of conformity with his ideas. These actions inferred that Darby was pretty much self-centered. He was really out of control, and he was kind of autocratic in his dealing with people within the religious or church setting. Echoing one Mr. Grant, the great Baptist preacher C.H. Spurgeon pens a stinging rebuke and analysis of Darby and the Brethren. This controversial feeling, often degenerating into something resembling regular quarrels, is the chronic condition of Plymouth Brethrenism. They are in a state of constant antagonism with the Bethesda party. When they have no one of the opposite party to quarrel with, they will disagree among themselves such as uh, higher church government and things of that sort, you have Darby ending up exercising virtually a papal author authority. And it's ironic that he would, would do that, but he effectively cut off those who disagreed with him, and he arrogated to himself, really, papal authority over the lives of others and the spiritual lives of others. A good example of this trend towards exclusivity and spiritual pride can be seen in the way Darby treated the Reverend Dr. G.F. Pentecost. When Dr. Pentecost failed to grasp a point Darby was making during a lecture, Darby, in front of other ministers, scolded him with these words, I'm here to supply exposition, not brains. This contentious spirit reared its ugly head again with American evangelist D.L. Moody. Again, according to Darby biographer W.G. Turner, Darby categorically disliked and disapproved of Moody and his ministry. He even wrote a letter to his followers warning that Moody would cause a great increase of worldliness into the church. Again, citing Pastor Spurgeon, Mr. Darby is, to all intents and purposes, a thorough pope though under a Protestant name. He will never admit that he is in error, and therefore very naturally declines to argue with those who controvert the soundness of his views. Even more egregious was the way Darby treated George Mueller, the philanthropist whose work with the orphans and his life of faith and prayer are legendary even today. Darby had labeled another brethren pastor, B.W. Newton, a heretic a term Darby would often use to mark people who disagreed with him. When Mueller received people who had been with Newton into his Brethren Fellowship in Bristol, Darby condemned and ultimately excommunicated Mueller for violating his principle of separation from evil. Known as the Bethesda Incident, this led to a split between Mueller and his followers, a group that became known as Open Brethren and Darby's, quote, exclusives. Author William Cox detailed the depth of this breach of Christian fellowship and charity, though attempts were made, most often by Mueller, to reconcile their relationship. These two former friends never saw each other again, and Darby continued to castigate Mueller until his death. Years later, Mueller, wrestling with the things he had been taught by Darby, noted, I am a constant reader of the Bible and I soon found that what I was taught to believe did not always agree with what my Bible said. I came to see that I must either part company with John Darby or my precious Bible, and I chose to cling to my Bible and depart from Mr. Darby. Mueller makes the point, and I think makes the, the great point, that when somebody really gets to start studying the Bible on their own, they can never come up with dispensationalism. I've never run into anybody who has studied the Bible who has been able to manufacture the dispensational system. The dispensational system is something that is superimposed upon the Bible. And this is what happened to me. As I got the rudiments of dispensationalism through the late great planet Earth, as I started to read the Bible, I couldn't fit the actual particulars of dispensationalism into what I was reading in Scripture, and I rejected the system as a whole 
Eventually, Darby's defense of not just dispensationalism, but an ever-growing body of new wine and deeper life revelations led him to conclude that only the brethren, and even more specifically, his particular sect of them, meet in Christ's name. The rest of the church was corrupt. We do not have time here to discuss all the things that splintered the movement. One modern day writer who remains a member of a brethren church noted five reasons why they split so frequently in those early years and why the divisions among them were so heated. One man dominated the movement. He was unaccountable and unchecked in his use of power. Differing views on non-essentials were not tolerated. Many times the teachings on non-essentials overwhelmed the central message of the gospel. No articles of the Christian faith kept the central doctrines in the forefront or provided a reference point for doctrinal discussions. Spurgeon concludes his sword and trial article with these devastating words. Plymouth brethren have no feeling wherever their principles are concerned. I know indeed of no sect or denomination so utterly devoid of kindness of heart. It is the most selfish religious system with which I am acquainted. It is entirely wrapped up in itself. It recognizes no other denomination, whether the Church of England or either of the nonconformist denominations as a Church of Christ. Mr. Darby has again and again said in print as well as written in private that those who belong to his party in the metropolis constitute the only Church of Christ in London. Darby died in 1882. He lived in an era of great eschatological foment. The 19th century witnessed the beginning of several millennial movements, Mormonism, Seventh-day Adventism, and the Jehovah's Witnesses, just to name a few. As historian Ernest R. Sandy observed, America in the early 19th century was drunk on the millennium. As already noted, much of this drunkenness was due to a radical paradigm shift away from preaching the gospel to wild prophetic speculation. Darby, like many today, believed that he was living in the terminal generation, the generation that would see the second coming of Christ. Dr. Francis Schaeffer, a premillennialist himself, labeled this phenomenon the this is that fallacy. It is the tendency to believe that this event in our time is the fulfillment of that prophecy in the Bible. The organization Darby Champion split too many times to ever grow very large numerically. However, its theological influence was profound and is still being felt around the world. As Ron Hensel points out, probably no Christian thinker in the last 200 years has so affected the way in which the English-speaking Christians view the faith and yet has received so little recognition of his contribution as John Nelson Darby. Thank you.